Good afternoon and welcome everyone to our Primetime Live program, Osteoarthritis and Lower Extremity Joint Replacement. Um, as a reminder, we do wear masks. We've got a very big room here and Dr. Steffel and I will make sure that we maintain six foot of distance so that you can understand us better without a mask on. Um, I also like to remind everybody how to ask a question. Um, see this arrow up here right in the corner? If you click that, you sh it should expand into a box that looks similar to this. Um, towards the bottom, it says enter a question for the staff. And if you just type it in and hit send, it will be sent to us and Dr. Steffel will address those at the end of the presentation. Our presenter today is Dr. Michael Steffel. Dr. Steffel received his medical degree and bachelor's of science degree from the University of Iowa. He completed a residency in at the University of Southern California Department of Orthopedic Surgery and a fellowship at the University of Indiana Department of Orthopedic Surgery. Dr. Steffel joined McFarlane Clinic in September 2019. Please welcome Dr. Steffel. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Vicki, for having me here. It's nice to be here and have a talk with everyone and just we can keep this nice and informal. And as we go along, uh, if there's questions, please feel free to ask and we can stop and go over those. This is a good time that you have kind of an hour of time with me and we can just go over whatever you'd like to talk about. So what we're going to do today is talk about who I am, uh, some basics about osteoarthritis, what it is, how this normally presents with patients, some treatment options, and importantly, the evidence for or against them, some indications for surgery, and then an overview of total hip, unicompartmental knee, and total knee arthroplasty. We're going to talk about some risks and complications of surgery, and then at the end, we can touch on a few controversies about some advertising uh, of things you might see. So a little bit about myself. I'm from Grundy Center, Iowa. Uh, I did my undergrad in med school at the University of Iowa and then went out to Southern California for orthopedic residency. I did do a joint replacement fellowship at Indiana University and then came back to Iowa, uh, which is something I've been very happy that I did. Uh, I have a wife, Claire, who works as a hospitalist doctor at Mary Greeley Medical Center. So some of you might have ran across her before. Uh, I do have a one-month-old daughter, Nora. And so if I look like I'm sleepy or going to fall asleep during this, that's probably why. And then two dogs, uh, June and Charlie. So some basics about osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis is a degenerative disease of synovial joints that causes a progressive loss of articular cartilage, which is the substance that's on the end of the bones and provides padding and stability. Uh, hip arthritis uh, has an incidence of about 88 per 100,000 people per year, and knee arthritis is more prevalent with 240 per 100,000 a year. What are some things that can put us at risk for osteoarthritis? There are some risk factors that are modifiable. Having things like trauma to a joint, our occupation with things like repetitive knee bending, certain conditions with mus muscle weakness, or even having a large body mass may put us more at risk for osteoarthritis, as well as metabolic syndrome with things like obesity and elevated fasting glucose. There are other non-modifiable risk factors, things like gender, in that females do have more of an incidence of arthritis than males, as well as increasing age and genetics, things that we can't really change. What happens when we have osteoarthritis? Well, there are some anatomic changes that we see. Uh, in terms of the articular cartilage, which again is the substance on the end of the bone that is a little bit like the gristle on the end of a chicken bone, we see an increase in water content change in proteoglycans, which are molecules that serve to function as cushion and stability. Organization and orientation of these get lost, and these molecules tend to lose their structural integrity. Uh, and then binding of these proteoglycans to something called hyaluronic acid, which the body makes, but we'll also talk about later in terms of an injection. In terms of the synovium, which is the inflammatory tissue around the joint capsule, in early arthritis, there are some mild inflammatory changes, and as arthritis progresses, there become more inflammatory changes, which lead to pain and dysfunction. 
Uh, there's also increasing vascularity in terms of the synovium, which can lead to more fluid in the knee. In terms of what happens to the bone, the subconjugal bone tries to remodel in response to the different stresses that it sees. And so bone can form some lytic lesions. Uh, and you also can see bone cysts that form in late stage arthritis. And I think I have an example of that in a few slides. Your body also can form something called osteophytes. These are commonly known as bone spurs. And these happen through the activation of something called the Indian hedgehog molecule, which is something that signals for more, more bone formation, just kind of an interesting fact. In terms of the cartilage, your knee makes something called knee and hip make things called matrix metalloproteases. These are enzymes that degrade cartilage over time. And there are some examples of this on the screen. These happen because there are some inflammatory cytokines that get made when you have more inflammation around the joint. And this leads to a cycle of inflammation, cartilage degradation, more inflammation, more cartilage degradation, and so on. In terms of radiographic changes, what happens on x-rays? Well, we do have a grading system for arthritis. This goes from a grade zero, which is no joint space narrowing, up through grades one, two, three, and four with progressive narrowing of the joint space and osteophyte formation, sclerosis, and deformity, as you can see more on the right than the left. Hip arthritis has the same grading scale with narrowing of that joint space. And here's an example of a hip that has all of these findings, complete loss of joint space, sclerosis, which is whitening of the bone, osteophyte formation, which are these bone spurs you may see down here and up here, as well as cyst formation, which are these little pockets right here. So this has all four of the characteristics of osteoarthritis. How does hip arthritis present? Hip arthritis patients often come in and say they have groin pain. And sometimes they feel like they say they really pulled a muscle and this muscle pull just never went away. They may have some stiffness in their hip. And oftentimes patients say they have difficulty with things like putting on shoes and socks or getting in and out of a car. And patients often have progressive difficulty with walking. In terms of knee arthritis, this can be somewhat similar. Patients come in with knee pain as well as stiffness and a loss of motion. Sometimes patients say that they feel their knee just gave way and they often have difficulty with things like stairs and getting in and out of chairs, things where your knee bends back and forth more. And patients often feel there is a progressive difficulty with walking. So now that we've talked a little bit about what arthritis is, uh, we can talk about some different treatment options and the evidence for these. Uh, and if there's any questions, again, please feel free to let me know. The evidence for these comes from a website that you can all go to and look at yourself, and I've included the address for that here. Uh, this Ortho Guidelines website is a group of consensus guidelines from the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. There are large panels that sit down and review all of the literature about every single one of the recommendations that they have listed and come up with evidence either for or against that recommendation, and then they rate how strong the evidence is. And so this is essentially a summation of all of the studies and literature out there about every single one of these topics. So you can click and review these recommendations and the studies that lead to these recommendations if you want to see what science actually goes into these determinations. So what are some good options for early management of osteoarthritis? In terms of uh, some conservative measures, Anti-inflammatories, as well as a drug called tramadol, are good first-line treatment for all patients with symptomatic arthritis. And there is strong evidence for this based on the AOS guidelines. Another thing that has good evidence for is using a walking stick or a cane. Now, I should mention that for people with knee arthritis, you should use that in the same side as your knee pain. But if you have hip arthritis, it's actually more beneficial to use it in the opposite hand of your bad hip. This functions to decrease the joint reactive forces on the affected hip when it's used in the contralateral extremity or the knee when used in the same extremity. And so you're decreasing the amount of force that goes through that joint, which helps it to feel better. And there is strong evidence for this. Other things that are beneficial include weight loss, 
activity modification, and an exercise program or physical therapy. And this should be first-line treatment for all patients that have a BMI over 25. And there is strong evidence to support this. Exercise aimed at increasing flexibility or aerobic capacity is also good. I often tell patients that yoga is a great thing to do in terms of exercise and flexibility. And then I also say things with water or wheels are also very good. Things like an exercise bike or an elliptical function to be great sources of exercise without a lot of pounding on your joints. And the same thing for being in a pool where you have the water that takes the weight off of those joints and makes you be able to do more exercise. Things like running on a treadmill uh, or significant uh, weightlifting may not be great options for you because that puts more force through these joints and may instead worsen the problem. So some things we cannot really recommend uh, in terms of evidence, glucosamine and chondroitin supplements. Um, many people take these. There's nothing wrong with taking these. They really don't provide you harm, but there is strong evidence that these don't function any better than having the placebo effect uh, from taking these. So again, if you take these and you think they're a benefit, by all means, you can keep taking them, but you should know that there is not really strong evidence to support this. The one study that did show some evidence used uh, something like the bottle here that ended in the word sulfate. And that sulfate molecule in the glucosamine and chondroitin actually can break off and get metabolized and function a little bit like the aspirin molecule would. And so that may be where some of the minimal benefit would come from. And so if you do use these supplements at all, make sure that you use ones that end in sulfate because you might get a little bit of a benefit from the uh, sulfate group itself. Other things that we don't have evidence for a benefit are acupuncture. Some people do try to do acupuncture, and again, there's probably not a lot of risk with this, but there is not strong evidence of benefit. Moving on to some more invasive treatments, we can talk about some different injections. Uh, one type of thing that you may get for hip or knee arthritis would be a corticosteroid injection. Uh, there is strong evidence of a short-term benefit in hip arthritis and some inconclusive evidence of short-term benefit for knee arthritis. And so that's why this may be a good second-line treatment for arthritis for these conditions. Um, again, short-term may mean several months. This is certainly not something that's going to change the physiology or anatomy of your hip or knee joint and so is not preventing further arthritis but is also just used for essentially pain control. Per AAOS recommendations, they generally would not recommend visco supplementation. So there are injections, usually based on something called hyaluronic acid, that are used as uh, pain relief. And some people refer to these as gel injections or things like that. Uh, there is strong evidence that these aren't any better than steroid injections. Now, this doesn't mean that they don't work, but it means that they haven't been shown to work better than a steroid. And the reason that because of that they do not recommend their use is because their cost is significantly higher than a steroid injection. But I should mention that I still do use some visco supplementation in patients if they've had a minimal benefit from a steroid treatment first, especially if they're not good surgical candidates and want to try a different type of option. So, you know, I would argue that even I go against some of the best evidence sometimes, uh, but it has to be done in a smart and um, efficacious way because these do have more of a cost. And then we get to some options for surgical treatment. So after patients have utilized conservative measures and if they have ongoing pain and disability and significant radiographic osteoarthritis, the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons would recommend joint replacement as the next line treatment. So for a hip, this would generally be a total hip arthroplasty. For knees, there are unicompartmental or partial knee replacements or total knee replacements. Now, one thing that they would not recommend is something called arthroscopy with lavage. Um, that's something that you probably would not see anymore, but that used to be uh, done where they would put a knee scope in a patient's knee and just wash this out with a bunch of fluid to try to wash out essentially any type of inflammatory uh, markers or molecules. Um, there is strong evidence that this does not provide any long-term clinical benefit and does put patients at risk. So this is something that has kind of fallen by the wayside and people don't just wash out a joint anymore for arthritis. So what are some indications for surgery? Well, 
For a hip, it would be end-stage symptomatic arthritis. In a patient that has had conservative measures that are not effective, and they need to be a good surgical candidate, meaning that the patient is not at significant risk of surgery from a cardiac or medical standpoint. What is a total hip replacement? This is a replacement of the acetabular cartilage and the femoral head with implants. These implants are generally press fit and have the bone ingrow to them to get stability, but sometimes we do cement the stem into place for patients that are older and may not have as good of bone quality. In terms of bearing surfaces, the bearing surface that I use is always a ceramic ball on a polyethylene liner. There are other bearing surfaces out there that have been used, including ceramic on ceramic, as well as metal on metal. And these do have benefits and risks themselves. The ceramic on ceramic bearings are actually something that have been a good option in terms of long-term wear. The downside of these is they actually can produce now and then a audible squeak. And patients don't like it when their hip squeaks. When you walk into a room and you hear squeaking, that's something people get tired of. And actually, if you go on something like YouTube and Google or YouTube ceramic on ceramic hip squeak, you can actually hear a lot of good examples of patients that have loud audible squeaking from their hip. Um, with that said, other than the squeaking, it is a very good option. Another option that has been used in the past is metal on metal. And these are the things that you sometimes hear commercials about late at night that says, if you've had this done, you know, call these lawyers because you may be at risk of uh, different issues. And the problem with metal on metal bearings is that there would be small metal shavings generated, and these could be absorbed into patient's bloodstream and cause systemic effects. And it also leads to a lot of bone reabsorption around the implants. So these are uh, clearly a problem. This was done more kind of in the last 10 to 15 years as a popular option, and we're still seeing patients that have had these and revising these uh, to non-metal on metal hips due to essentially this metal ion disease. In terms of a hip replacement, surgery length usually takes between about one and a half to two hours, including closure. Uh, hospital stay, I tell patients, is usually one day, but sometimes, especially for younger, healthy patients, you could go home the same day, and we'll talk more about that later. In terms of physical therapy afterward, generally we do not recommend physical therapy right after a hip replacement. Patients can walk and build up strength that way. Um, and this is not anything that's new. Um, out of the Mayo Clinic, they have not done therapy in their total hips for 20 years. So uh, really is not found to be needed after a hip replacement. In terms of general restrictions, I have patients do what we call general hip precautions, which mean avoid flexion significantly over 90 degrees or any significant rotation of the hip, especially for the first six weeks. And then after some of the soft tissue around the hip is healed, we can relax some of these restrictions. In terms of recovery time, I tell people that generally they feel pretty good at one month, and most people when they come to see me at one month are happy, which is nice, um, but you're not back to normal. And generally it takes up to about three months to get patients feeling more normal in terms of strength and a little bit of swelling and feeling of overall comfort and being back to all normal activities. I'm gonna talk just very briefly about approaches to the hip because this is a question I get a lot in clinic. Um, there are many ways to get to the hip joint, but the two most common approaches are the posterior and the anterior approach. Uh, the posterior approach for decades has been the gold standard for hip replacement. Um, there were concerns about higher dislocation rates prior to surgeons doing a good job of repairing the hip capsule that we go through. Now with a good capsular repair, uh, this is less of an issue. Uh, the anterior approach, although it seems like it's the new way to do things, is not new. This was actually described back in 1883 in a journal uh, from France, so certainly not a new thing. Um, benefits to this would be that it goes through an intranervous plane instead of an intramuscular plane, and so no muscle has to be divided uh, from this procedure, at least theoretically. With that said, through a small incision, muscle often does get damaged through this exposure. Surgeons started going more to an anterior exposure because they thought it would have a lower dislocation rate. And I'll have some studies later that show that this has actually not been shown to be true. One benefit of an anterior exposure is a possible quicker recovery. So here's a study out of uh, New York University in 2019, so a pretty recent study, that looked at more than 3,500 hip replacements. 
they found that their anterior approach had a higher rate of complications and actually was their highest rate of all the uh, approaches they studied compared to a posterior approach, which had the lowest rate of complications. Uh, the rate of dislocation was actually lower from the posterior approach. And so they found that a posterior approach hip had a significantly lower overall complication rate compared with the anterior approach with an equal or better dislocation rate. The biggest differences in complication rates they saw were that the anterior approach hips had higher rates of periprosthetic femur fractures, usually because you don't see the femur as well through that approach, and higher rates of infections, probably because the incision is more in the groin crease, which can be a source of infection. Here's another study from 2019, so again, a pretty recent study that looks at uh, patients between 2013 and 16, uh, and they essentially divided these up into the DA or direct anterior group or the NA, which is not anterior group, which was mostly posterior uh, approaches. And what they found were there were more deeper infections in the direct anterior group compared to the non-anterior group. And so after a big multivariate analysis, they felt that the direct anterior approach was 2.2 times more likely to result in a joint infection than a non-anterior approach. And then the last study I'll talk about here was a clinical research award winner at our national meeting in 2019. And they looked at uh, follow-up studies uh, based on outcome scores. Uh, what they found were comparing 100 direct anterior and 100 poster lateral patients uh, that were matched and followed with different outcome scores. They found that direct anterior patients did not have any difference in pain scores at six weeks or beyond. And so what this really says is there's not a lot of faster recovery outside of six weeks and beyond with this approach. So multiple other studies have shown these things, significantly higher blood loss, operative time, and cost with a direct anterior approach. So there are several choices. Uh, I choose to do what's the possible slower recovery, but what I feel is a less chance for a significant complication. There is alter other alternatives, including possible quicker recovery, questionably lower dislocation rate, but a higher rate of infection and fracture risk. I think the thing that boils down to more than anything is just choose a surgeon who's good at what they do and gets good outcomes. And no matter which way they do your hip replacement, you'll likely have a successful hip replacement that you love for years. And again, I'd like to caution you to don't believe everything you see on the internet. The internet is not regulated. Uh, if you see some of the people that post things on there, uh, you might have a little more doubt about what you see. So hip replacement in general does have some risks there are risks of infection. And if an infection happens, it can be a disaster and need more surgeries to correct that. A dislocation, as shown in this x-ray, can be a, a significant problem that's devastating for patients and oftentimes requires either a closed reduction in the emergency room or even an open reduction and possible more additional surgery to correct the problem from this. Patients can get a deep vein thrombosis or pulmonary embolism known as a blood clot, which could be uh, dangerous and even fatal. Patients could get fractures or could get leg length inequality from having hip replacements done. All of these things should be rare complications, but they're not never events. And so patients should know that there's something that could happen and clearly try all conservative measures before going on to a hip replacement. Now let's shift some gears if we don't have any questions and talk about knee uh, replacement. So indications for a knee replacement surgery depend on if we're talking more about a partial or a total knee replacement. Partial knee replacements are a good option for patients that have arthritis only in one compartment of their knee. They need to have failed non-operative treatments, have a BMI under 35, a correctable deformity, and an intact ACL. So when you combine all those things together, there's actually not that many people that meet good criteria for a partial knee replacement. And this is really only about five to 10% of my knee replacement practice. Most patients uh, better fit the criteria for a total knee replacement with symptomatic knee arthritis and have failed non-operative treatments. Now I do wanna point out that total knee replacements do have lower revision rates than a partial knee replacement in the setting of a unicompartmental arthritis. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. So in terms of a unicompartmental or partial knee replacement, this is when one compartment of the knee gets replaced. And usually this is the medial compartment, even though these can be done for the lateral or patellofemoral compartments. Implants get cemented into place 
the ACL and PCL need to be preserved for this surgery. And the bearing surface is cobalt chromium on a polyethylene plastic liner. Surgery length is usually an hour to an hour and a half. In terms of hospital stay, this is often a same day procedure. Physical therapy afterward is required to work on getting motion back and strength back in the knee. There are not really restrictions on activities other than basic restrictions of things like avoiding pounding activities. So I would tell people don't do things like jump on a trampoline or go skydiving or things like that. And recovery time, I find that patients feel pretty good at one month and by three months gets you mostly back to normal. Benefits over a total knee replacement from a partial include that it feels more like a natural knee and has less exposure and less recovery. It's just less of an invasive surgery. Uh, but some downsides from a total knee replacement are that there is an increased rate of revision of these type of surgeries, so you may need more surgery in the future. And revision to a total knee replacement from this is more complex than just doing a primary knee replacement in general. So I have an analogy that I tell most patients. I say that to me, a total knee replacement is kind of the dependable workhorse. It's longer lasting and it's kind of like a pickup truck that it may not be fancy, but it'll get you where you need to go. And I compare this to a partial knee replacement that in the right patient may have a quicker recovery and feels more like a normal knee. So I say it's kind of the sports car, gets you where you want to go and is a little more flashy. And I think it's funny that out in California, when I tell patients this analogy, they'd say, yeah, sports car, sports car. And when you come back to Iowa, a lot more patients say, no, no, I, I want the pickup. Give me something that's reliable and won't need another surgery for the next 15 or 20 years. Partial knee replacements also have complications. Things like infection, stiffness, fracture is shown in this x-ray. We can see that that whole implant is fractured off of the side of the knee. Blood clots potential loosening, and worsening wear in other compartments. And that's shown with these x-rays. We can see that the lateral and patellofemoral compartments have worn out and don't have a joint space left at all. So now that we've talked about partial knee replacement, if we don't have questions, we'll proceed on to talking about a total knee replacement. So total knee replacement is a surgery where we shave off the end of the bone of the femur the tibia and usually the patella and cap these with metal implants and a plastic liner in between. The surgery length on this is generally a little longer, usually more like 1.5 to two hours. The hospital stay is sometimes same day for certain patients and sometimes I'd say usually an overnight stay and go home the next day. Absolutely, you would have therapy afterward and this therapy again functions to get back range of motion and strengthen the knee. I don't really have a lot of restrictions for patients with a total knee replacement, although I do caution patients that for whatever reason, it just feels strange to kneel on a knee replacement. You won't hurt the implant uh, or cause any significant damage, but it just feels strange. And so I do, do tell patients if they're doing things like gardening, where they may be kneeling for a prolonged period of time, to wear knee pads, which can help with that. And then in terms of recovery time, I tell patients that the first month is generally a struggle. Uh, knee replacement is not an easy surgery to bounce back from, and the first month is hard. We get patients through it with pain medications and therapy, and then the second month starts to have some good days where you're happy you did it, and then some days where if you go do more activities, you feel like you pay for it the next day. By about the third and especially the fourth month, you finally end up with just good days and are happy that you had the surgery, but it does take a while to get there. Benefits of a total knee replacement include a reliable improvement in pain, possible increased motion, and benefits to stability and activity. There are risks with any type of surgery, including a knee replacement, and this includes infection, stiffness, fracture, DVT or PE, and loosening of the implants, uh, which can be an issue more longer term and need to be revised in the future. One thing that we can do to combat some of this loosening would be a cementless knee replacement. Why would we do a cementless knee replacement? Well, oftentimes it's the cement bone interface that loosens long-term in patients that have had a knee replacement. In general, patients now are younger and more active than they were um, years ago when knee replacements were first designed. This leads to more rates of revision, especially for loosening, and cementless fixation can help this issue by getting what we call biologic fixation. This means that the bone ingrows into the roughened metal surface around the knee, 
And if it does this, it can continually renew itself compared to cement, which does not. Here are some graphs which show that the incidence of revision uh, and the causes for that over time in patients uh, under 55 years old. So looking at both men and women, the green line that continually goes up and up and up is for loosening. Uh, that's different than uh, some other things, instability, pain, and infection, that the rate of those really does not significantly go up over time, but loosening continues to be a problem the farther out you get from the index procedure. Cementless knee replacement is not new. Uh, this was done in the 80s and 90s and unfortunately had some pretty bad results. Some of the designs of these implants uh, had problems. Uh, there were issues with what we call screw track osteolysis, where along these screws, uh, plastic particles could cause bone reabsorption, which was a problem. There were poor plastic liners that led to more plastic particles, and there were metal-backed patellar components that had a lot of failures. And so the designs of all of these things have been changed over the years, and these problems have really been dealt with, with things like better plastic liners, not needing screw fixation, and having better patellar components. And I actually still do cement all of my patellar components, even on cementless knees, uh, just because I think it's probably the long-term safer option. So here's a study that looks at cementless knee replacement. Patients from 1983 to 1986. Uh, these were young patients with a mean age of 59 years old. And what they found were, with good follow-up, there were very few failures. So they had a 97% survivorship of these implants at 20 years. That's really good. And they found that that was equal to, or even better than a cemented knee replacement, even though the patients with the cementless knee replacement were, were younger by 11 years and should have had more wearing out of these components. So to do this, patient selection is critical. These need to be done in younger, active patients, uh, this is gender dependent, but usually male patients do better with cementless knee replacements because they have more dense bone. And you need to really not do this in patients that have issues like autoimmune disease, osteoporosis, kidney disease, transplant patients, or anyone that smokes, because these are things that lead to poor bone quality, uh, which can be an issue with bone ingrowth. Uh, here are some other studies that again show that cementless knee replacement in patients that are obese or um, may have other issues can still be done safely and actually may be a benefit. So the risk of a cementless knee replacement is that there is a small chance that that bone may not ingrow or the implant may become loose early on. Now this is a very small chance. I quote patients usually about a 1% risk of this, but if that happens, that's a big deal and would require an early revision to cement implants into place. But the benefits of long-lasting fixation and a lower total overall risk of revision, I do feel outweigh the risk of uh, bone not ingrowing if done on the right patients. So now that we've talked about different types of replacement, if there's no questions, we proceed forward with uh, same-day replacement surgery. So this is something that's become more popular, especially in the last five to 10 years where patients can come in, get their joint replaced, and go home the same day. Uh, again, patient selection is really critical for this. These should be patients that are younger, and I generally use 65 as my cutoff, uh, even though sometimes we do go above that for patients that are very healthy, and uh, no major medical issues is an important part of going home the same day. Patients need to have a good support system, and they need to have a good understanding of recovery expectations and what to look for. Benefits of going home the same day with a joint replacement include avoiding a hospital stay. Now, this became really important when we had more of, uh, you know, COVID times in the last six months because we weren't able to admit patients to the hospital uh, due to having the hospital being full of COVID patients. And so we did a lot of same-day joint replacements, and actually these went very well and patients were very happy with these. You can recover where you're comfortable. I tell patients you can be in a hospital bed or you can be in your own bed. Which would you like more? You have control over things like your own medications, your own food, etc. You don't wait for people to bring those to you. And this is an option to save money because you don't have a hospital stay. However, there's a downside to going home the same day, and that's a possibility that if you had a medical reason, you may need to come back to the hospital. Now, that's not something that's very common at all, and this should be 
uh, reduced by doing this on the right patients and not patients with uh, a poor support system or medical issues. So the last thing I'd like to talk about is just a little bit of controversies in the treatment of joint replacement lately. Um, I do get a lot of questions in clinic about different types of regenerative medicine. Uh, and people will bring in newspaper ads and talk about TV commercials they've seen. So there's a lot of claims that get made um, with really zero scientifically proven results uh, so far for this. Um, it's just a fact of life that many people uh, want your business, they want your money, and they will prey on fears that people might have about different things. So I just would caution patients to please be careful, please be skeptical of some of the different claims. Some things that sound too good to be true probably really are too good to be true. Um, an example of this here is shown by what I highlighted. Um, they said that research shows that visco supplementation could assist in helping cartilage in your knees repair and regenerate. There is absolutely zero research out there that any of your knee cartilage can regenerate from any source of injection. That's why degenerative knee arthritis is such a big issue. There's not a way to regrow knee cartilage. This statement is absolutely false. Visco supplementation doesn't even have a theoretical reason of why it would help with regeneration. There's also some misleading claims. Um, here's a claim that says that uh, injections with, without state-of-art imaging might miss the right location up to 25% of a time. That's not true. Few studies have ever shown these findings. Uh, generally, that's you know a small group of non-surgical doctors doing injections and then saying that they uh, may not get medication in the right spot. These have been used to justify the use of ultrasound for knee injections, which is not routine. And what I'd like to point out is providers that use an ultrasound for a knee injection get reimbursed at a higher rate for this. And usually that's not disclosed to patients. So again, be careful, be skeptical. Um, here's an example of a recent TV commercial that showed an animation of a knee injection where there was some blue goo that got injected into a patient's arthritic knee and led to a miraculous correction of a deformity. Uh, this absolutely does not occur with any type of injection. Um, the anatomic structure of the knee, if there is a deformity, will not change from an injection. Uh, there is zero evidence that has ever shown this. So again, just please be careful with what you listen to. And, um, you know, some things out there might not have a lot of risk. And so I tell patients, if you really want to try it, by all means, go ahead and try it. But know that there's a significant uh, financial contribution that often is paid uh, not by insurance companies. And I just don't want patients out there being taken advantage of and getting scammed out of a lot of money. So just please be careful. Okay, with that said, uh, thank you. Um, I'm here for any questions that we might have. And you know, you've got me for the remainder of the hour. Feel free to use this as a extended uh, clinic visit and answer any questions that anyone might have. Uh, questions. Do you do minimally invasive surgery? Um, I might need a little more clarification on that question if we're talking about hips or knees. Knee replacement itself is not a very minimally invasive surgery at all. The joint has to be exposed, and I would refer to that as more of kind of a maximally invasive surgery, unfortunately. There are big metal components that need to get put into the knee, and that can't be put in through a very small incision. Uh, in terms of hip replacement, uh, I do try to do what's called a mini posterior approach. So that's a smaller incision um, that is still not a completely small incision in terms of what some people think is minimally invasive is, you know, an inch or two. This is still more like a five or six inch incision for a hip replacement. Uh, I do tell patients that incision size really kind of parallels BMI and patient size. Uh, we have to get as much exposure as we need to do the case. And so uh, for patients that are skinny and have a low BMI, absolutely that incision is smaller, uh, but that's not all the time. Uh, next question, what are your thoughts on non-surgical procedures that are being done? Again, I might need a little more clarification on non-surgical procedures. Are we talking about uh, injections or things like that. Um, I'm not quite sure what that one means, but if you can have a clarification, I'm happy to go through that. Um, 
are hip replacements an option for treating a broken hip in patients with osteoporosis? Um, it may be. So it depends where the hip would be broken. Um, the hip joint itself uh, tends to get fractures in a few different places. The femoral neck, uh, what we call, so that'd be one option. Another one would be the intertrochanteric area, so the area between the greater and lesser trochanter, and subtrochanteric, which means under that area. So generally, subtrochanteric and intertrochanteric hip fractures are treated with a uh, metal implant that would go in, uh, like essentially a nail that goes down the femur to repair that. Femoral neck fractures are a little bit different. Uh, these fractures generally don't heal well with fixation, mainly due to the blood supply of this area, and these are often treated with some type of replacement. Um, oftentimes that replacement is what's called a hemiarthroplasty, which is half of a hip replacement, where the femur side is replaced, but the acetabular component is not. Sometimes in patients that are younger that have a femoral neck fracture, uh, we do a total hip replacement, and I have done this in the past for patients that have a femoral neck fracture and are younger and more active. Uh, so certainly uh, that can be done, and oftentimes patients that have a broken hip do have osteoporosis. And what we do to kind of mitigate a little bit of the risk of fracture from surgery with a hip replacement or a hemiarthroplasty is generally I would cement that stem into place, uh, instead of press fit, because that lowers the rate of fracture. And so certainly that would be a good option uh, for a patient with a broken hip if they have uh, osteoporosis. Okay, moving along, questions. What can be done for chondromalacia? Chondromalacia is essentially early cartilage degeneration that has not proceeded into frank cartilage loss or, osteo or um, osteoarthritis. Um, some of the options that I talked about in terms of uh, weight loss, exercise, anti-inflammatories, and even injections are all good options uh, for chondromalacia. Depending on patient age, um, especially younger patients, there are some procedures that can be done through an arthroscopy. Um, including something called microfracture, which is where uh, small uh, holes are poked in the bone with a needle to stimulate bleeding with the hope that that bleeding becomes some scar tissue and covers up that loss of cartilage with uh, essentially a cap of scar and gives some pain relief. So there are some different options for treatment, but depending on patient age, it is generally conservative management and try to avoid osteoarthritis. Um, do you give a second opinion on knee surgery that is one year old and still swollen and painful? Absolutely. Um, part of my job as a joint replacement specialist is to uh, evaluate and treat uh, joint replacements that may have issues and need revision or may not need revision. And so I do see patients um, that have had prior joint replacements before. And so certainly if that's something that you want to evaluate it, I would be happy to do that. Is there an age when a patient is too old to do a joint replacement? That's a great question. Um, I don't have an absolute number in terms of an age where I would say a patient is too old for a joint replacement. What is important to me is that the patient uh, medically would be a good candidate for surgery and that we can safely get them through the surgery. Uh, with that said, I have done primary joint replacements on patients 93 and 94 years old within the last six months that medically uh, were good candidates and did very well. I routinely operate on patients that are in their mid to late 80s, uh, and I have even done a revision knee replacement on a 90, or no, a revision hip replacement on a 97-year-old uh, patient, uh, which is slightly stressful but needed to be done, and we did it. Oftentimes, patients we operate on for a hip fracture are older, um, which, you know, that's the patients that unfortunately get hip uh, fractures. And I've operated on patients up to 100 and even 101 years old due to a hip fracture. Um, so certainly, you know, this is one case where I do say age is just a number. We don't want to be cavalier about patients' age because oftentimes there are concerns that go along with that. And we do send patients for a very significant medical and oftentimes cardiac clearance prior to surgery to make sure that we can do it safely. Because really, for me, that's what matters is getting patients 
through surgery safely and having a good outcome with improved pain. That's what, that's what we're here for. So. Okay, sure. Um, and again, if there's any other questions that come up in the future, um, you can let Vicki know. I'm happy to answer those questions. Or, um, you know, you can always come see us in clinic and we can have a discussion about whatever you'd like to talk about. So thank you very much for your time. I appreciate uh, being here and being able to talk to you. So thank you and thanks, Vicki. Thank you so much, Dr. Steffel. Um, great information, and you have a wonderful presentation style. I, it was very easy to follow, and um, I'm sure you'll have some people coming to visit you because uh, it was easy to understand, and it sounds like you maybe have some op um, options for some people. So thank you for joining us, everyone. want to remind you we have one other program this month. It is uh, Wednesday, March 31st, so about a week and a half away, 2 p.m. again. The Impact of Aging and Exercise on Immunity. So if you haven't signed up for that yet, um, I did send the link to that a while ago. But if you don't have it and you want me to send it to you, just shoot me an email. Or if you have another question for Dr. Steffel, you can send that to me as well. So thank you for joining us today and have a great day.